Okay, very first chapter of FP2 is something called number theory. Now, number theory sounds like a very broad kind of concept, doesn't it? And actually, number theory is a branch of math that explores the deeper hidden patterns within numbers, especially integers. You're going to pretty much see this whole time we're really going to be looking at just integers here. And this is kind of cool, like these deeper hidden patterns within numbers. You'll kind of see what I mean with even just some of these examples down here. And it helps us to better understand their behavior and relationships. And it can feel quite abstract and feels quite puzzly. And at the same time, it also feels quite elementary. Um, feels like quite like some of the foundations of mathematics. Um, but it does have applications in things like cryptography and computer science. So there's some bits of this where you're going to be like, hey, I feel like I remember looking at this when I was at primary school. And we're going to be then sort of accelerating it right up to sort of further maths and even in stuff that would be in your degrees if you go and do maths at A level. And what number theory does, what we'll be looking at are kind of problems that sound like this. So very, very sort of GCSE here or even key stage three what is the highest common factor of 15 and 25 we won't use this language highest common factor we'll use something different called the greatest common divisor but we've actually been looking at number theory problems already up until this point and then things like what is the remainder when two, th two to the power of a thousand is divided by 13 now it's very simple in sort of its its phrasing and its wording um, because we all know what remainders are from again like sort of primary school stuff but if you try and do two to the power of a thousand and divide it by 13 it is going to be such a huge number we're going to see if we can solve this problem without actually working out what this number is is there kind of a different approach that we can take to this and again for a similar thing here showing that 2 to the 20 plus 3 to the 30 plus 4 to the 40 plus 5 to the 50 plus 6 to the 60 is divisible by 7 and we're not going to do this by actually working this calculation out because it would be huge and incredibly time consuming and it wouldn't even fit on the screen of a calculator so number theory is about you know can we can we show you these things can we prove these things without actually having to calculate some of these parts that we have here it's split into two different parts, okay? So we do division algorithm and Euclidean algorithm. We do something called modular arithmetic, which is kind of like, again, something we've already thought about in real life, but we haven't thought about mathematically before. We look at divisibility, again, stuff you maybe will have looked at in maybe year seven or primary school. And then the second half gets a little bit more complicated with some congruence equations, a little theorem that helps us do some of this stuff. And then combinatorics, which again is stuff that you will have seen before. And I think most people find this really quite an interesting area and it's, it's a nice little way to finish off this first chapter. So as we kind of embark on this, what we're going to do is take some of things that we've learned about previously, some of these words that we have here, and we're just going to kind of like elevate the language a little bit, which just means we're going to just describe these things in a bit more of like a kind of posh kind of way. And I kind of wish we just always used this. I don't really know why we use this sort of like language that we probably will have done in primary school, but we do have this kind of new language that goes with this. So previously, when we would have called a number a factor, we would now call that number a divisor. So there's no notation for that, but we would say three is a factor of 12. So we could now actually say that three is a divisor of 12. So if A is a factor of B, we can now say that A divides B. So instead of saying that something is a factor of it, we say that A divides B. And we just do this line that goes in between them. So this notation, A divides B, means that this number is a factor of this number. And you can kind of tell 3 is a factor of 12 here. Um, you can also tell that this number has to be less than or equal to the second number. It wouldn't be possible for this one to be bigger than this one. So it's always getting a sense that A a will be smaller than B or potentially equal to B as well because obviously um, any number is a factor of itself. If it is not a factor of B we say it does not divide B. We just do this line but we just draw a little a kind of not line through it like this so same kind of process so 5 is not a divisor of 12 or we could say 5 does not divide 12 in other words 5 is not a factor of 12. Now, common factors of A and B, we would now call that a common divisor of A and B. So we could say that the notation could be C as the common divisor, because if C is a, if C divides A and C divides B, then C is a common divider of A and B. And I didn't bother putting an example with this one. 
Now in GCSE, and I kind of mentioned this on this slide that we had up here, that if we have a highest common factor, we used to call that the HCF of A and B, we now call that the greatest instead of highest. We still have the word common, but instead of factor, we have the word divisor. So we have the greatest common divisor of A and B. I don't know why we don't just use this language right from the beginning. And we write this with GCD, greatest common divisor, and we put in brackets the two things we're finding the greatest common divisor of. And in this case, it's just A and B. So the greatest common divisor of 15 and 20 25 is 5 and that kind of answers that first question that we've got there it's the highest common factor of those two numbers and then if we had that the highest common factor of two numbers is 1 we've not used this language before but we could say that those two numbers we are talking about we could either say that they are co-prime or that they are relatively prime they only share one as a common factor so I've written that their greatest common divisor is just one and I've given you an example here that the greatest common divisor of 10 and 21 is 1 they don't share any other common factors than 1 so we could say that 10 and 21 are co-prime so if I use the word co-prime or relatively prime. I'm talking about two numbers that don't share any factors other than one here. So we're just going to try and do some very, very simple examples here of looking at a pair of integers and determining whether the first integer divides the second. In other words, whether the first integer is a factor of the second one. And we're going to do this using our new notation that we have. Now, this is pretty straightforward, right? All I need to do is check that 143 can be written as something multiplied by 11. So if I do 143 divided by 11, it is 33 times 11. Hence, we can say that 11 divides 143. Now we've got minus 4 and 28 here. So I want to say, can I write 28 so that it is something multiplied by minus 4? And it is. It's minus 7 times by minus 4. So yeah, we actually can say that a negative is a factor. So that's a bit different to what we've done previously. We've usually just said we talk about positive factors of a number, but actually negative 4 divides 28. Now for part C of the question, this is pretty obvious, right? 15 is not a factor of 47, and that's because 47 is going to be uh, 3 lots of 15, which is 45 plus 2 more. So that means that there is some kind of remainder here. Hence, we're going to say that 15 is not a factor. And I'm going to use that new language. Hence, 15 is not uh, does not divide 47 that we have in this case. Now, part D of the question, we have 3 and 2. Well, if we're going to try and say if 3 is a factor of 2, well, kind of quite clearly, that's not going to be something that divides it. Because if we said with 3, well, 3 is just a 0 times 2 plus, no, not 0 times 2, it is a 1 times 2. Oh, well, no, we're doing the second number. So for us to do it as the second number, we're saying does 3 divide 2? 2 is 0 lots of 3 plus 2. So again, there is a remainder. Hence, we're going to say here that 3 does not divide 2 like this. And then our last one is 16 dividing 0. So we'll say that second number. Can that second number 0 be written as something multiplied by 16? Well, yeah, it can be. 0 times 16. So this is quite strange. So now we're saying, hence, 16 divides 0. And actually, this is going to be true for all values of a. Anything divides 0 because 0 times by that number will give us 0. So the ones where we could, we were able to write it as a multiplication like this. So that last one is probably the only strange one that we've got there. Now, again, this is very basic. We're going to find all the divisors of 8 and 11. And we're going to use the fact that also we've just said that negative numbers are also divisors that we have here. So for 8, we know that the things that can divide 8, it's usually a 1 times 8. So we could have a plus 1. We could have a minus 1. We could have a plus 8 and a minus 8. Also, we could have 2 and minus 2 and 4 and minus 4. And then for part B, for 11 here, we know that there's only two numbers that will multiply to 11. So actually, with now our new idea of being able to write negatives as well, we can have 1 and minus 1 and 11 and minus 11 for those factors. Well, I keep saying factors, or I keep wanting to say factors, but for these divisors that we've got here.
And then sometimes you might be asked to do things with a little bit more kind of formal language that comes with this. So it says here, given that A, B, and C, this symbol means is a member of, and the Z, if you've not seen it before, means the integers. So it's telling us here, A, B, and C are members of the integers. And we're going to prove that if A divides B, and if A divides C, then A divides BN plus CM, for all m and n which are integers. Now that kind of sounds like a bit intense of what's going on here, but if we just kind of think about it with a number, for example, so if I was gonna say, I don't know, that three divides nine, and also three divides 12, then what we're saying here is that three will divide, uh, what's my b, nine lots of n, plus 12 lots of m. And that kind of makes sense that if we're saying here, if you multiply 9 by some integer and you add it to 12 multiplied by some integer, this whole thing is still going to be divisible by 3. So it's really just trying to formalize some of these bits where with numbers it just kind of seems intuitive. We're just going to try and use a bit more of a formal approach to show why this thing works here. So let's start off by saying that because uh, a divides b, then what this means is that b is equal to k multiplied by a and i've said here where k is some kind of integer that we've got and that should make sense right this is the bigger number and we're saying that because a is a factor or a is a divisor of b then a multiplied by another integer is what gives us b and if we've also got that a divides c then we could say to ourselves that c is going to be equal to well i've already used k so I'll just use another one that I've got, I'll use a different letter. I'll say that C is equal to JA, where J is also equal to an integer that we've got to this bit. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to investigate the BN plus CM. So BN plus CM that we've got here, well, we've just said that B is equal to KA. So B equals KA, and that's KAN. And CM is going to be JAM like this. And so what I can do is take a common factor out of these things so that A, that is multiplied by KN plus JM. So we've now got this statement that is written like this. Now this actually looks like this kind of thing that we've got here. If A divides B, then B is equal to KA, where K is an integer. So if we want this thing, A, to divide B, then we should be able to write it as A multiplied by some kind of integer that we've got here. So all I'm gonna say for this last part is as J, K, N, and M, as they are all integers that we've got, then kn plus jm, that must also be an integer that we have there. Hence, we can now just jump to this last part of saying because we have a multiplied by an integer is equal to this thing, then a must divide this thing that we have here. Hence, a divides bn plus cm which is what we were aiming to do for this particular part. Now, I think this is quite like abstract with all of these letters absolutely everywhere. So that's why I did that part of the beginning and saying, well, if three divides nine and if three divides 12, then we wrote to ourselves that three divides nine M plus 12 M. And that's kind of what we were trying to prove here. It feels quite intuitive in this kind of way, but this was us doing it in that kind of language. And this sort of statement here, that this, um, this statement could be written in this kind of way, we used that in reverse to do that last part of the proof. Now, I've rarely seen them ask any of these kind of proofs in the exam. So I'll do like one or two of them as we go, but we're mostly focusing on some of these um, sort of like other skills that come up in this particular bit. So in the next video, I will talk to you about the division algorithm, um, which kind of starts getting us into some of the proper stuff of number theory, because right now we've just done some very, very basic new stuff that goes with it, but it's a kind of stuff from GCSE just with some new notation. So I will see you in the next video.